Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, uh, today is customer safety versus customer service, rethinking customer response in a post-COVID environment. And I am Jordan Lanziski, the Deputy Director of the Experience Team at JCC Association of North America. This session is being recorded, and we understand that some people don't wish to be recorded, in which case you may turn off your camera. But we do encourage everyone who's comfortable doing so to stay visible so that we can feel as if we're all together. If this is not the session you intended to join, please return to spot me and select a different session. My name appears as the host at the top of your participant list, and you can use the chat message to address any needs that you have. We aspire for every person to feel that they belong at ProCon 2021, and we're working to build an inclusive space for which all people feel welcomed, respected, safe, and fully included. To that end, we encourage you to consider the following suggestions as we begin our time together. We invite you to rename yourself in Zoom with your name, your agency, and if you're comfortable, adding your preferred personal pronouns. We've enabled closed captioning, and you have the option to turn it off using the bottom uh, button on your toolbar. Please reach out to me in the chat if there's anything we can do to enhance your learning experience. We're thrilled to offer this multifaceted conference at no cost to our JCCs, which was made possible because of our very generous sponsors. Each sponsor believes in the JCC movement and the incredible work that JCCs accomplish day in and day out. Their representatives are proud to be with us to share their expertise and offerings. We hope you will join us in showing appreciation for their support by visiting their booths in our virtual vendor hall. We encourage each of you to connect with them anytime during ProCon and beyond. During the conference, you can use the chat feature to connect with them on the SpotMe platform, and after the conference, reach out to them using their contact information as listed. Today's session, we will review questions abound about the new normal. The customer is always right service approach can raise safety concerns for all, particularly when staff involved are essential to ensure continuation of service. In this session, Bill Kirkner will discuss how the evolution in public perception of what it means to support and protect essential workers calls for transformation of management's approach to customer response, especially when it comes to safety issues. Participants will also hear from JCC professionals about innovative programming that they're running at their facilities and how those programs can be replicated in other JCCs. But first up, Corinne Labarski, Head of Growth for Focus Health, will highlight ways to capture additional revenue for your department and your agency. Corinne Labarski has worked in the aquatics industry for over 23 years. She has a seasoned perspective on the internal and external landscapes of JCCs, as she has spent 13 of those years as the Director of Aquatics at JCC Greater Boston. Corinne specializes in driving revenue growth, building partnerships, aligning strategy for expansion, and collaborating with other industry leaders. Focus Health is the largest independent provider of virtual and in-person American Red Cross and American Heart Association classes. Please welcome Corinne. Jordan, thank you so much for the introduction. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here virtually at ProCon. As Jordan mentioned, I have quite the unique experience. Um, up until very recently, I was the aquatics director at JCC Greater Boston uh, for the last 13 years. And this year, I am helping JCCs get involved with Focus Health as a sponsor. Uh, Focus Health was pivotal for JCC Greater Boston in many ways from 2019 to 2020, and we'll hear all about why during this presentation. So if everyone can take a brief moment to fill out the poll that I'm going to launch now, that would be most helpful. I am looking to see where all of you are um, at when it comes to training your staff. Okay, so if everyone can take a moment just to read through those questions and vote, that would be very helpful. Thank you. 
So for the folks that are listening who are in charge of their department, um, you guys are always conflicted between making extra revenue for your facility while attempting to lower expenses at the same time, which is very, very daunting. I know, I know the feeling how we have to do it all the time. Um, so from a show of hands, who wants to make extra revenue for their JCC? I think we all do, right? Yeah. And now who wants to save money at the same time for their JCC? Fantastic. All right. That's what I thought. So let's dive in uh, and I can show you how Focus Health can, uh, can in fact do both of those things and how two JCCs uh, from 2019 to 2020 uh, did just that. All right, I'm just gonna minimize this real quick. Okay. Whoops, sorry. Okay. So Focus Health, we are one of the largest independent providers of virtual and in-person American Red Cross classes. Uh, we have also started with American Heart Association and American Safety Health Institute certification classes as well. We are dedicated to serving our communities in all training programs, uh, but more specifically for CPR, first aid, AED, as well as basic life support, lifeguarding, and water safety. Focus Health offers comprehensive training solutions throughout the entire country. We specialize in customized training programs for all organizations, both nonprofit and for-profit, in uh, specifically, like I said, Red Cross, AHA, and ASHI. We also, in addition to all of our training program management, we help source AEDs as well as first aid and rescue products. So in working with all different types of businesses throughout 2020, I've noticed that many organizations struggle with training and certifying their staff. Whether you lack the space, or just struggle to navigate the logistics of getting an entire workforce trained, this is something that Focus Health excels at. Our innovative training solutions help businesses save time and money. Not only could JCCs save time and money, they can also generate ancillary revenue by partnering with us to utilize space in their facilities to conduct classes for their communities. This would inevitably mean more traffic throughout each center, which could turn into future memberships or other engagements within your facility. So for ancillary rental revenue, uh, what we did with a couple of JCCs, which I'll talk about in the next slide, um, is we utilized their space. They had uh, great space for us to run our CPR classes and we take care of all of the backend work. We are getting all of the marketing word out there, uh, paying for all of those dollars and making sure that we're driving traffic to that particular class. Um, and all you guys need to do is just let us into your JCC um, and utilize that space. So I know with COVID that has uh, definitely proven to be a little bit tricky. Um, and a lot of the centers are just starting to kind of, you know, reimagine what their new spaces are going to look like, uh, who is allowed in at that particular time, just based on, you know, jurisdiction uh, within different states. Um, but now we're starting to see, you know, the vaccine kicking in, folks, you know, a little bit more um, willing to go out of their, their comfort zone a little bit. And so this is why we're here today at Procon to see if we can continue our partnerships with some of the JCCs that were doing amazing uh, working with us. And then unfortunately COVID had hit. So the other benefit for JCCs is discounts on staff training. So from the poll, I noticed a lot of you um, are doing your own training, which is fantastic. Um, we can also offer you a benefit there, which I'll go, uh, go through in a couple minutes. But as far as discounts on staff training, if you do not have staff that are currently trained at your site to train your either full-time staff, your part-time staff, whether they're trainers or uh, in your early learning childhood programs, um, we are able to bring those staff to you and train them in, in your building for uh, a nonprofit discount. In addition, those discounts continue on with member and community training with, prom with promotional codes. Um, and for the JCCs that I just mentioned who actually have staff that um, are able to train in-house, 
we offer a very significant reduced certification processing fee by aligning with us. So that would mean that your instructor who you staff at your JCC, we would align them under the Focus Health umbrella and you guys would be able to uh, share in our, our cost benefits with the Red Cross when you purchase those, uh, excuse me, when you process those fees. And as you know, and being a trainer, those processing fees are upwards of $30 per person. Um, and we can get that down significantly with uh, working and aligning with Focus Health. Uh, the other discounts that we can offer are AEDs and other safety equipment um, at either discounted or potentially wholesale costs as well. Uh, the other piece that where JCCs can benefit, just keeping your community safe. I know that all JCCs share within the same mission, and we want to make sure that, you know, in the event of an emergency, your team, your staff, um, and the folks around you sort of know uh, what they're doing and, you know, where your safety equipment is. And I think that is something that, um, you know, in helping us with our mission um, can truly benefit your JCCs and the communities you serve around your JCC. And then lastly, partnerships within, um, we have held a lot of water safety webinars. I know next month uh, in being aquatics, I'll, I'll never be able to forget the month or the date, <laughs> but May is water safety month. Um, and we have worked with uh, the Westside JCC and other pools and other um, communities that uh, we run safety webinars for their swim academies and swim lessons. Um, additionally, we can partner with any of your ELCs or, you know, camp uh, departments on uh, what to do in the event of a choking or other CPR emergencies and kind of run those, those webinars for, uh, for your team as well. All right, so now the most important part, uh, the revenue piece. So I have two examples here on my screen, one from JCC Greater Boston and the other from the West Side JCC. So literally on opposite ends of the country. Um, and in the span of one year, so right before COVID hit, um, JCC Greater Boston had 121 classes at their facility. And um, that was at the time where I was the aquatics director. So we ran them for $50 per class. Um, and that was the revenue that uh, the JCC was making per class. So we ran them roughly two to three times a week. We did a Tuesday and Thursday evening class and also a Saturday morning class. And over the course of that year, JCC Greater Boston brought in an additional $6,000 in net income. On the other side, um, and that was just opening their doors. Again, we are doing all of the, that back end work um, and it was just to use their, their space. The revenue made at the Westside JCC, so same year and um, time frame, and they had 119 classes. And again, they did roughly two to three times a week, again, Tuesday, Thursday evenings and Saturday mornings. And there we did a revenue share with, with that group um, at 15% gross, and they brought in roughly $10,000 in net income for that year. Again, just from allowing us uh, to utilize their space um, and to take advantage of that. So I'd love to take any questions at this time. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. There we go. Um, if anyone has any questions, I would love to help answer them. Um, we would truly love to partner with all of the JCCs across the country, help certify your staff, whatever that looks like, whether you take advantage of us actually coming into your facility and help training or if you would like to align under our Focus Health umbrella to utilize all of those amazing benefits in the uh, processing fees and getting a, a huge discount in those as well. Feel free to put your questions in the chat and Corinne will address them. Um, and she's also gonna put her email in the chat for everyone so that um, you have a direct link to her. How about now, are all aqua classes pay classes? How about? Are all aqua classes pay classes? Um, aqua classes, are you talking about lifeguarding courses or? Sorry, I think that was to. Do you offer or... practice AED pads at a discount? We do, yes. 
Are, oh, yours have ripped apart. Okay, so I left my email there for you so I can certainly help help source some AED pets for you. Those are important. So we want to make sure you get those. Um, Great, and Heather at the JCC in Austin also said that she's interested in hearing more um, aligning for ARC discounts. And one question from Justine is, what do you charge for lifeguard certs? So for lifeguard certs, um, right now, let me... We can't go. We can't, I can't actually tell you what the what the actual discount is, um, but just know that it's it's significant. Yeah. Why don't you reach out to Corinne um, via yes. email, and she can get you more information related to your specific location. Correct. Um, all right, terrific. Thank you so much, Corinne. Corinne's email is in the chat. If you scroll back up a little bit, um, and we will have time for more questions at the end. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. So we will move on. Bill Kirkner needs no real introduction, but I will go into one anyway. He served as a subject matter expert for the last two versions of the American Red Cross Lifeguarding Program and was appointed to the USA Swimming National Diversity and Inclusion Committee from 2011 to 2015, where he served as chair for three years. Bill considers his most important work to be the development of young staff members from rookie lifeguards into young professionals. He has extensive expertise in all aspects of aquatics programming, including risk management, regulations, compliance, capital building, pool operations, staff training and development, certifications, leveraging USA swimming memberships, evaluation and program development. So please welcome Bill. Howdy everybody, how are you doing? Um, good to see everybody today. Unfortunately, I'm used to doing these things. We were talking about this earlier. I'm used to doing these things in a room where I can see everybody and we can get energy back and everything else. So look at where your bar is for your stuff. And there should be an icon that says reactions. Um, if you choose react, if I say something and you're like shocked or if you're happy or if you're something like that, there you go. I see Jordan has put a thumbs up uh, icon on uh, and things like that. Um, so uh, if you if you have a reaction to something I'm saying, go ahead and do that. And um, also, please feel free to jump into chat. Um, and and Jordan's going to be looking for stuff in chat if you have things that you want to say. Because this whole presentation was kind of intended to make people think uh, and and probably get some discussion. So so let's see how we do uh, in our in our huge Zoom environment here. I know we were able to do a little bit of this earlier last year. Um, but we'll see how it's going. Jordan, I'm sh am I sharing now? We can see you, okay. yes. Okay, but are you seeing the, pre seeing the presentation now? We okay, are, great. yes. Okay, great. Um, all right, so <clears throat> because this is a professional conference, this, this seminar needed to have a really professional sounding name, which is why we called it customer safety versus customer service, rethinking customer response in a post-COVID environment. Because that's what you get when you have a master's or a doctorate, you get lots of multiple syllable words. But I really wanted to call it is everything you know about customer service is wrong. Um, and that's how I wanted to, to start the whole thing because we've been told a lot of stuff, especially by our folks in, in membership and, and things like that about how we need to act in certain circumstances. But if I'm being a little bit more generous, um, I really think it's not so much everything you know about customer service is wrong, uh, more like an awful lot of what you have learned about customer service um, is probably misguided. And that's especially true now that we've gone through uh, over a year of pandemic response and things like that. So I, I wanna pause because um, we're at a, a JCC Association JCC Association meeting. Um, we should always start with a little bit of quick Jewish learning. And so what I wanna do is, is hearken everybody back to the historical role of the prophet, okay? Um, and the historical role of the prophet is that the, the prophet usually is there to speak truth, even if the truth is unpopular or in conflict with the position of those in authority. Um, the ideas are often expressed in broad or dramatic terms in order to create an emotional response. Uh, and the point is to make people think or consider a different perspective on the current situation. Discomfort with new ideas or challenges to conventional authority is often part of the process. So why am I saying this? because I'm expecting that some of what I'm about to say is the sort of thing that if you went right back and told your executive, they told me at the JCCA professional conference that, that you'd make people angry or upset. 
Um, and that's not the point. I don't want you to go back and say, you're completely wrong. I want you to think about the, the overall concepts that we're talking about here. And if it generates discussion for, for your team in-house, that's the overall idea. But the other side of it is I'm completely okay with taking calls from executives later who want to say to me, what the heck are you talking about? And, and all that other sort of stuff. Um, and in fact, I will tell you all uh, that some of the things I'm going to say, especially later on, I've already had these conversations with executives over the last couple of years, um, when I think that the role of customer service has come directly into conflict with the, the role of providing safety for your customers, right? So let's start with the concept. Um, and Jordan referred to it in her, her startup. How many of you have ever heard this phrase before? especially in your customer service training. Yeah, you can just go ahead and raise your hand if you want to. How many people have ever heard the phrase, the customer is always right? All right. How many people actually believe that the customer is always right? In fact, would it surprise you to find out that that is not actually what the, the saying is supposed to be? Um, that is not what the original saying was. The original saying actually was le client je ne j'aime tort, um, which is French. And it actually means the customer is never wrong. And if you see who said it, it's a guy named Cesar Ritz. Now, does the name Ritz ring a bell to anybody besides the crackers? Um, there's a set of hotels with his name on it. But he was actually most famous uh, for food. His hotels became famous because of food. And the rest of that, if you, if you actually read his book, the rest of that story says that, um, that's the first part of the phrase, but the rest of the phrase says, if a diner complains about a dish or wine, immediately remove it and replace it, no questions asked. And the point that he was trying to make at that point is actually a biological or scientific one and not a customer service one. Um, those of us who have done uh, you know, genetics and things like that before know that different people react and different people taste things differently. Some people like the taste of cilantro and to some people cilantro tastes like soap. Um, and it's the same thing with how people react to the tannins and wines and all of that other sort of stuff. So what he was saying was not so, it was a customer service answer, but it was, it was very practical. Um, rather than saying to the chefs or the waiters or something like that, you know, he's like, don't get into a fight with somebody. We know that you put a lot of time and attention into doing what you were doing. But the reality of it is, even though it tastes great to you, different people taste things different ways. And it's not worth it to get into a fight over that. That's just a scientific reality. Right? So he wasn't saying that the customer who's badly behaved, the customer who throws a temper tantrum, the customer who, who uh, makes a mess in the dining room, um, or is disruptive is always right. He was saying that when a customer says, I, I can't stand this, this just doesn't taste right to me, that that's when they're right. So how did this idea that the customer never makes a mistake come into our regular culture of customer service? Well, um, has to do with a, a bunch of folks, but most notably, um, ever heard of a company called Sears Roebuck and Company? Have I ever heard of Sears before? All right, so back in 1905, they had in their training materials for Sears Roebuck that every one of their, th this is for their, their managers, and this was a direction that every one of their thousands of employees are instructed to satisfy the customer regardless of whether the customer is right or wrong. Um, and we know that because of that really strong sense of customer service and their dedication to doing whatever the customer wants, that, that is why Sears Roebuck is the reigning uh, leader in commerce today, right? Okay, um, actually that was the story for a bunch of different people. It was an idea that was pioneered and popularized by uh, Harry Gordon Selfridge. So if anybody's a PBS fan and ever saw the show Selfridge, uh, John Wanamaker and Marshall Field, those used to be stores once upon a time. And again, this wasn't hospitality or, or the sort of things we're talking about. This was in the space of retail that they had this idea. Um, and what they were saying was basically, if somebody comes in and is asking for a specific thing, don't try, and we don't carry it, don't try to sell them something else. If a person comes in and they want a specific brand, if they want a specific type of watch, if they want any of those sorts of things, 
don't try to sell them some don't try to sell them our brand if they already know what it is that they want don't try to twist their arm if you know where they can get it correctly go ahead and tell them and the idea there was you increase your 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 credibility you increase your your level of knowledge with respect to the customer about knowing what it is that they want and it gives the impression that you really most care about what the customer wants right and so anybody who's had to live through christmas with kids and specific toys knows how this goes right if they want the the six inch jawa from the star wars black collection and that's what your kid really wants to make is the nothing else is gonna is gonna make it but if you know that the store down the street has them or regularly gets their shipment on a specific day right you enhance your level of expertise in the perception of the customer and your credibility by telling them where they can find what they want. Um, and R.H. Macy, this is actually in, if you've ever watched the Christmas movie Miracle on 34th Street, uh, the character who plays R.H. Macy actually makes this point and explains that we want them to come back next time. And if they know that we're gonna be helpful in that respect, then maybe they'll come back and buy from us again. But it wasn't that if the customer said, I deserve a 20% discount or the customer was being disruptive, that they were always right. It was that if they knew what it was that they wanted and they said what they wanted, then you should help get to help get to what they want. And in fact, even though those ideas were being popularized in the early 1900s, by 1914, business leaders um, and business writers were actually challenging us. Um, and they were saying, if we adopt the policy of admitting whatever claims the customer makes to be proper, and if we always settle them at face value, we'll be su subjected to inevitable losses. And if the customer is made perfectly to understand what it means for him to be right, what right on his part is, then he can be depended on to be right if he is honest. And if he is dishonest, a little effort should be made in catching him at it. So even as this was first beginning to get popularity, people were disagreeing with the concept of, of is the customer always right? So back to the question, customer is always right, true or false? Anybody have any feedback, any concepts, any things you wanna say about that? Anybody wanna pop in and, and give us an, an example of when it might or might not be true? I'll just say, even when they're, parent is on the board or uh, they're, you know, a donor to the JCC or that doesn't mean they're right. <laughs> okay, that's that's correct. Okay, so how about in aquatics? Any examples from aquatics? Okay, I also, Reagan. Um, I would also say sometimes patrons will say, well, I'm allowed to do this at another pool. And that is maybe correct. That does not necessarily mean that you get to do it at my pool. Okay, or the lifeguard who was on yesterday said that I could do this, which, yeah. you know, that may be the lifeguard or the or the person from early childhood or whatever said that they could do that and they didn't know or what weren't enforcing it properly or were preoccupied with the drowning kid at the time that it was going on. And they said, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, to get somebody out of the way, it, right? So lots of different variations on that. Any other versions? Jamie, go ahead. Yes, we want um, we want them to be as satisfied as possible, but within the parameters of safe safety and safe experiences. Right. So the twelve-year-old girl who's trying to do a backflip off of uh, the side of the pool when that's expressly not allowed is that customer right? The kid who wants to go off the diving board, even though they've never even put the, or the parent wants their kid to go off the diving board, even though they've never put their face underwater in swim lessons. Is that person right? The, uh, depending on where you are in the state of Maryland, Maryland has laws about changing diapers poolside. And it's, a, it's the sort of thing that can get you shut down uh, by the health department if you allow people to change diapers anywhere but in uh, but a proper changing area. So, oh, but I always do this wherever I happen to be and they have their kids set on a picnic table that they're gonna change the kid's diaper on a picnic, trust me, for real, this happened frequently. Is that right? Okay, so we've known that for forever and ever, but what we're talking about today is that I think over the last uh, year, there's been a sea change, not just in how we see these questions of whether the customer is always right, 
but in the larger environment with customers in general. Um, and so, you, you know, I think we've seen a situation where uh, this concept where people internalized and got the idea that I am, if I'm the customer, I am always right, may have been taken a little bit too far, right? Um, anybody recognizing they were very careful with us saying that we had to be cautious about what we could put on for, for you know, using other people's stuff and everything else. So I'm only using stock images and everything else here. But does anybody recognize what I'm talking about here? What, what happened in the last year? What happened in the last year? Same people can talk if you're the only people who feel comfortable talking. Hey. People were requested, required to wear masks and be safe in a pandemic environment. And? And some and, chose to do it and some chose not to. Okay. And how did, how did everybody else react? What happened with the rest of the world? How did the rest of the world react to that? Let's put the managers and the, the officials at the different businesses to the side. How did the rest of the world generally react to that? Cancel culture. Okay, I wouldn't necessarily put it that way, but 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 you're on the right you're on the right track. What do you mean by that? Well, we were very just divisive. Certain people, we all had our own opinions, and they all had you know sometimes they didn't mesh. Okay. How did we become aware of all these things? You see all these pictures. How did we get all these pictures? Social media. Social media. Hmm. Okay, social media. So where exactly were they coming from? Smartphones. Okay, that part's true. That part's Not true. I'm trying, okay, but I'm trying to ask something else. So here's the thing. If we can see the customer who's involved and the employee, who's taking these pictures? Bystanders, other patrons. Other patrons. And what's the point that they're making here? What's the point that, why are these other patrons taking these pictures and posting these videos? They're what are they saying? The what? The other people are not following the rules. Okay, and how do they feel about the fact that other people aren't following the rules? They don't feel safe. They don't feel safe? They're frustrated? It makes it feel like you shouldn't follow the rules also. Like, if it doesn't matter, why am I? You know what I'm right. asking you. Right. You go back and you look at the if you go back and you look at the, the captions on these videos and everything else, overwhelmingly the third party observer is describing the customer's behavior as being unreasonable or abusive. Not the manager, not the employee. In most cases, they're taking the side, they're taking the side of the employee who they feel is being improperly treated in these cases, right? Um, and in fact, we know that this isn't just kind of a tug of war in how people think about this stuff. In fact, it got to the point where it coalesced and quickly became a meme, right? A nickname, which we will not use here, right? Um, indicating a level of negative consensus about this behavior. Does I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to talk around it, but does everybody know what I'm talking about here, right? That it quickly became shorthand that people were able to, there was an immediate shorthand that came up as to the people who it was who were behaving in this way. Does everybody know what I'm, what I'm there was a nickname for a lot of these people. So this, can people nod please? <laughs> they know what we're talking <laughs> yeah. about. Okay, but what, what does that tell us? Overall, what does that tell us? Without being, without being social scientists, what does it tell us that that concept spread like wildfire and was picked up by so many people and everybody knew what it meant right away. What does that mean? The social expectation of how customers um, should behave has changed. Okay. That the customer isn't always right. Right, so, so let's pull that out a little bit, right? That to the general customer, to the general customer, they're not okay with people taking this kind of privilege, right? 
especially when it comes down to issues of health and safety. Okay, so especially when it comes to issues of health and safety. And second, when it comes to the power differential that's always been there between the customer and the employee. I think a lot of people have become much more aware of the people who are using their, I am always right privilege against somebody who is a minimum wage worker who's just trying to provide the service or provide whatever else is going on there. And I think we came to a general overall kind of national consensus on those people who act that way, all right? Um, this process has probably been evolving for a while. Uh, the question of public safety probably helped crystallize this idea, but I think that people have felt this way, but just weren't necessarily willing to come out and say it. It took the fact that there was a health and safety aspect to it to make the general population feel like they were able to step forward and say, this is behavior I don't like, stop it. This is behavior that should be named and shamed. You should know that this person behaved in an, in a, in an, in an unacceptable way, all right? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? In my mind, it's because um, suddenly lots of people got to experience, for those of us in the products, what being a lifeguard is kind of like, right? Um, that all of a sudden there was uh, an expectation about enforcement of rules, right? Your, your regular line person, the person stocking the groceries and everything else, all of a sudden had uh, a responsibility for enforcing rules, that they had to learn special procedures necessary to keep people safe. They had to learn how to use special or different equipment for the protection of themselves and the general public. They had to make sure that customers were using their safety equipment properly. Um, and they had to do things like enforcing safety limits and where were people allowed to be and how many people could be in an area at the same time and stuff like that. And does that feel like what a lot of us have had to deal with for forever and ever as lifeguards, right? So now all of a sudden, lots of people got to experience what that was like. And when lots of people got to experience what that was like, um, I think a weird dynamic happened, which is that, uh, you know, I think for years and years, I think a lot of us have had the situation where, um, you know, you offend the person who, whose cousin is on the board or something like that. And all of a sudden the 16, 17 year old lifeguard is being asked to make an apology, even though, uh, they did the right thing, but that's not what happened in this case. What happened? What did the managers do? What did the managers and, and the other employees do? Come on, you know this, it's, it's simple. I'm just trying to get some sort of interaction so we can pretend we're all in a nice room like in Orlando or something um, and that we're gonna go have a great dinner or something afterwards. I'm, I'm trying my best, but what happened? Jamie, come on, tell me what happened. We felt supported. The, the, the everyone bought in. Right. The managers were like, if that, if that person who's stocking my groceries walks at 8 a.m. tomorrow, there will be no groceries on the, on the shelf. And so I need to make a decision as to whether I'm going to stick with this. You know, we're really strong on customer. We're going we're gonna to put up with all this nonsense or whether I'm going to have a business to run from day to day, right? Um, you know. So I think our understanding of customer service has really changed. Most customers do not like entitled behavior displayed by other customers. Many customers are willing to publicly call out and denounce behavior that they think is unsafe and abusive. If an abusive, or, we've all heard that thing about, you know, you, you, you gotta be careful about how you deal with people because they're gonna go out and they're gonna tell 10 friends. Has everybody heard that, that thing about, you know, the, the everything else? All right, so, so we learned something in this whole thing. They may go out and tell 10 friends, but the other people who saw the bad behavior are gonna put this on social media and tell half a million. And not only that, the 10 friends that they go say, you'll never believe how I got treated at this store are high percentage chance going to be, you acted like a jerk. They're not gonna support that kind of entitled behavior, particularly when it comes to questions of health and safety. Right, so that fear that we've always had that if we're mean to somebody, I'm not advocating being mean to people, but that if we somehow offend somebody that they're gonna go out and destroy our reputation. 
What we found in this whole thing is that actually we might be destroying our reputation by not standing up for our employees and not standing up for our health and safety guidelines, right? And in fact, those of you who have ever, who have watched these videos and things like that, have you, have you watched any of them? Have you noticed that not only do the customers video, but then in a lot of cases, they, they like cheer, they join in, they applaud when the, when the person's removed from the store. Wow, I don't think we've ever thought of that before. When we've been putting up with these people who are sitting in our lobby yelling and screaming at our membership departments and everything else, have we thought about the, well, what's the impact to everybody else who's going on here? You know, when we've been putting up with that stuff and allowing our head lifeguard to get to get hammered over and over again because it's the right thing for them to just like, sit in steeple. You know what I'm talking about? We're just gonna sit there and, and respond that way. Have we thought about, well, what about the 40 other people who are around and how they're, and how they're reacting, okay? Um, in fact, in fact, um, this is how bad it got, right? Um, if you're a fan of customer service, take a look at these signs. How is this compared to the traditional way that we've been taught customer service? Jenny, come on, jump in and say something. You're laughing there. Jenny, say something. What do you think? I, I think it's crazy, but now we can empower ourselves and really do the right thing for health and safety because we need to keep control of what's going on around our pool areas and we need to really be policing. I am policing pretty much all the time I'm there because people don't want to follow the rules. Look at, look at these signs. These are signs that are, that are from the front of businesses. Did you ever think we'd see a space where you'd have people saying, this is to accommodate the anti-maskers, it's a reflective surface so that you can look at it because you're the only person that you care about. Did you ever think we would get to a point where you would see folks saying, I don't care what you have to, the one on the far left, right? Um, where it's like, these are the excuses that we're gonna get. And basically it's like, shut up and go away and, and do what we tell you to do. Yeah, I, did you ever I think, think I think part of go the ahead. problem is, can you hear me okay? Yep, go ahead. I think part of the problem is that, you know, in some instances, some of these signs have lost being professional about your communication. And that's a mistake. You shouldn't ever fall to the level of the people that we're complaining about. You know, that we're, we're all talking about the fact that, you know, somebody comes up and goes, do you know who my husband is? Do you know how much money I have? Do you know this? You know that? Well, I should be allowed that. These signs that you're seeing with the, you know, I could train my dog to do this and you big disgrace and all that falls to that level. We are professionals. We should maintain a higher level and never lose professionalism. I think that's a good point. And in fact, part of where, where we're going to hopefully go to on the downward slope of this thing is talking about how do we deal with that and what's a way to think about this that's slightly different. I, I, I completely agree with you. I think that this is not necessarily the, the place that we want to get to. I was trying to get to the point where, um, where everybody gets that this has become common, right? That, that, that I think the pendulum swung a completely different way on, on things at this point. Um, so, but just noting how far it went in this case with people being concerned about supporting the people who are responsible for health and safety. And so how does this apply to aquatics? Let, let's get into that, right? How does this apply to aquatics? Aquatic staff members are regularly asked to educate users and enforce safety rules. In many cases, there's a perceived cultural power imbalance between the staff member and the member of the user or the guest, right? The 17, 18, 19 year old lifeguard who's being asked to make a correction to the 30 something parent is already in, in a, a power imbalance. The person who's paid for a year long membership and maybe paid for camp and knows how much that they put into your agency, right? Is looking at somebody that they perceive as a minimum, aid, minimum wage worker and they have a feeling as to level of entitlement and things like that along the way. Um, because of lack of experience, inconsistent application of rules, lack of familiarity with the facility, guests frequently act in ways that are unsafe, inappropriate, or not allowed. Where are you, Reagan? 
Is this what you were saying? Because of lack of experience and consistent application of rules, lack of familiarity with the facility, guests frequently act in ways that are unsafe, inappropriate, or not allowed. Yes. Right? That's what you were saying before. Somebody else told me it was okay. I, I'm able to do this at a different place or something like that, right? So because it's not consistent, and we ran into that as well with respect to masking rules and all that other sort of stuff along the way. Um, I have a note here. Um, we're not going to delve into it, but... Uh, it is Autism Awareness Month. And so I also want to put a quick caveat here that for people who work in aquatics, this challenge can be exacerbated by the fact that there are users and guests who are unable to process and properly respond to safety information and, and education and things like that. And I'm not just talking about people with special needs. The two, three, and four-year-olds may not be able to properly process safety information. You know, it takes training and everything else along the way. And that's why it's part of thinking about this whole thing. Now, I wanna address the mouse in the room for a minute. Um, so does anybody have people that you've sent from your agency or executives or things like that who've gone to take Disney customer service training because, or have read the books about Disney customer service training uh, and stuff like that along the way? Um, because I think that this is one of those, one of those things we wanna talk about when we talk about professionalism um, and, and things like that. Because these guys are right considered the brand, right? When it comes to professionalism and customer service uh, and all the other sort of stuff. Now, anybody who's had me come visit uh, and, and talk to their executives and they, anytime somebody hits me with the Disney magical moments thing somewhere along the way, um, I, they know that I can be a bit blunt. And I usually am like, if you are, if the person's willing to pay uh, the amount per day that they're currently paying per year, um, and they're going to pay that every single day, I can make a lot more magical moments. I can also pay my staff more and I can buy more facilities. If everybody's paying me a couple thousand dollars every day, which is different than people who are, who are paying a couple hundred dollars per year, right? Disney has a lot more resources to work with when they say, give lots, of, you know, make magical moments and, and do all that other sort of stuff, right? But there's still the concept that we want to try to make people's experience better. Um, as it turns out, uh, I have a niece who's currently down working at one of the, the, the animal kingdom places down in Orlando. She's a, a zookeeper type. Um, and we were having a conversation about this specific thing in the Disney, uh, the whole Disney approach and everything else. And she just up and said, oh no, there's lots of reasons you can, kick the, you can get kicked out of Disney, no questions asked whatsoever. Right? And they basically boil down to four things. Um, unsafe behavior violations of health and safety rules, right? You climb on the track, you try to take over the controls from a, a, a worker or something like that. Um, but even if you're using a safety stick on a, a, a selfie stick, not safety, a selfie stick on a ride or things like that, they consider that unsafe and you can be immediately tossed out for that. Um, mistreatment of cast members, right? And cast members is their name for employees and the people who are working uh, at, the, at the parks mistreatment of other guests, um, and theft or fraud. So even in a place where, uh, where it's considered that you're gonna go completely out of your way to provide great customer service, it's important to remember that even those guys have limits and that their limits have to do with health and safety and how people are treated, right? Which corresponds to the stuff we've been talking about. So with the idea in mind that we also wanna be professional how do, we, how do we address this? Um, so a little bit of a story. When I was in law school, um, I worked my summers uh, at a place called the Baltimore Country Club. Um, and some of you may have heard of it because Baltimore Country Club's actually hosted things like women's PGA, the LG, LPGA, the golf things and everything else. Um, and I'm not bragging at this point, but let me just say that Baltimore Country Club was one of those places where uh, the joining fee, the initial joining fee, cost about the same as a small house, and the monthly fees were like the, the rent on a decent condo downtown in Baltimore. That's the monthly fees. So if you were ever going to have a place where people were going to feel entitled, it was going to be there. Um, but they had a rule that was a very strict rule um, that they enforced universally. And the Baltimore Country Club rule was no abusive or impolite behavior will be tolerated. No other, no other anything 
none ever will be tolerated. So it didn't matter if you were the president of the board and the waiter dropped soup in your lap, if you got up and proceeded to scream obscenities at them, you were getting dismissed for three or four months at the very least. If you were a kid who came and said to the person who worked in the pro shop, do you know how my daddy, who my daddy is? And it was some other con concept than other than I wanna put something on my charge. Right? If you said to a lifeguard, I don't need to listen to you because X, Y, or Z, um, your parent's account could be suspended. Still have to pay for a couple of months, but would be completely suspended. And so the question um, was, the question you know, that we've always had is, if we enforce the rules and we make people act the way we want them to, if we, if we you know, defend our, our employees and we enforce the health and safety rules, are we going to be able to keep our members? And the reality of it is at the time that this was true for me, these folks had a way, despite the fact that it cost an arm and a leg, they had the waiting list that was like forever long. And part of the reason that they had a waiting list that was forever long was because people didn't wanna be around all sorts of drama. When they came, what they wanted was for people to be nice. We talk about you know, welcoming people into our J's as if we're welcoming them into our home. Or, or something like that. But what they want when they're there is they want it to be a place that's supportive and friendly and things like that. And by the way, is safety part of your brand? Because I actually believe safety should be one of the strongest parts of your brand. It's great that you talk about Jewish tradition and culture and, and teaching language and this and that and everything else. It's great that you talk about uh, you know, activities and all those other sorts of things. But honestly, in my heart, I believe that when a parent is trying to decide where to send their kids for camp, the first question that they have is whether it's going to be safe or not. And at the end of the day, that they, if they know that you're being consistently safe and that you're requiring everyone to follow the rules, no matter how important they are, I actually think that people go back, just like those customers who did the videos and stuff like that, I think they go back with the knowledge that the most important thing to you is being safe. And that has intrinsic value along the way. But this is something we should have already known, right? This is something we should have already known, but I think maybe we kind of got it wrong because we've, already, we've always had this concept at the J's of Shalom Bayat, right? Anybody want to hop in? What is Shalom Bayat? What is Shalom Bayat? A peaceful house. Peaceful house, peaceful house. And I think that for a, for a long time, part of what we've been doing is just trying to get the person who's yelling and screaming and being upset to be quiet. And we've seen that is the way that we're gonna have a peaceful house by making the person who's, who's being extreme, not as extreme. By, by the way, I pulled this picture from somewhere else. It's a guy who does wood carvings and that's the link to what it had, but that was the best version of Shalom Baya I was able to find. And I wanna give him credit for where you go there. Um, so, um, but I think there's something we need to think about when we think about the concept of Shalom Baya and the way, how we deal with this stuff in a professional manner, right? The people who work for us are the ones who live and build in, who build and live in the home that we're talking about when we're talking about the concept of Shalom Bayan. Our staff are the people who actually live there. The other folks are our guests, right? But without our staff, we would not be able to actually welcome people in and provide hospitality, right? They're critical to us being able to invite our guests into the house that we wanna build. Um, and the thing that we've learned here is that Regularly giving in to unreasonable behavior only promotes more unreasonable behavior. Anybody, please, is there anybody who, who agrees with me on this or can, or can support this, right? You have the person that you, that you, that you accommodated and they, they were being unreasonable. I'm seeing a couple thumbs up and things like that. Did it get the person to stop being unreasonable? No, it has makes it, it worse. Has it ever worked that that, that accommodating the person who, who wants to bend or break the rules because they're special has ever, it's been that and it's done and you move on. No, who said it, Reagan? Was it you who said 
It always makes it worse. It makes it worse. Um, so we've had reservations for lane lines um, and something that I've worked really hard to maintain is that I don't want anyone who follows the rules to get punished. Um, if we have empty lanes, doesn't matter to me if you come and swim without a reservation. Um, but in the event that we have seven lanes, six lanes for seven people, I don't want someone who did what we asked to be the one who's not swimming. But, but I'm a member and I pay and I pay your salary. Don't you understand that? I want you to come swim. Here are the times that you can do it. We have really high demand for lanes right now. We're making some changes to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to swim. Um, we've got really high demand and six lanes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but but the fact that I can say it and I can see a lot, I can talk in that sort of tone of voice and I can see the 20 of the 30 people on my screen start to nod and, and, and whatever kind of tells the story right there, right? By by allowing this kind of Jody, you have something to say? Oh, no thanks. Okay. No, I get told daily about how um, the only reason why they pay their dues and they paid for the last year is because of the swimming pool. So I should have that right hand lane whenever I want it. I, I'm really lucky though; I have support, so I could you know just spew out the rules again and tell everybody how I want a level playing field, and then my supervisor, the executive director, will take over if he needs to. Right, and by the way, part of the reason we're saying have these discussions now is because as we begin moving, as we begin moving from, Kathleen, I see your hand, we'll get to you in a second. As we begin moving from, you know, COVID world to our new normal and trying to figure out what the new normal looks like, if you've had that sort of experience with your executives and everything else, you know, do you have an opportunity to sit back and say, hey, you know how we dealt with these situations before? I need you to know that that's what it's always like for us, because we're always responsible for health and safety and enforcing these kinds of things. And it's good that you've been backing me up for this past year, but I need you to know that this is always important to my 15, 16, 17, 18 year old lifeguards to know that people have their back. And it's a good opportunity to say, you know how we've dealt with all this sort of stuff? I, I need you to appreciate that, that I, I need that all the time. I need that to be true moving forward. So Kathleen, I see your hand up. Does that it, go ahead and unmute if you got something? Well, yeah. I want. Can you all hear me? Go ahead. I wanted to share a story that has uh, just recently fallen into my lap. I've been here 25 years in New Orleans, and uh, I've always had my backing for 99 percent of the time, as far as safety first here in New Orleans. And my executive director backs me up 100 percent. So kudos to my team here. However, I had a situation, I don't know if y'all facing this, because we didn't have swim lessons last year due to COVID, we are now being slammed with swim lessons. And though yeah. I have a, a good slate of teachers, there's a, a, a just a, a huge springtime demand the way we can't even keep up. So we're unfortunately not able to renew when we're doing swim lessons, second and third sets, because we have to work our way down the list. Is everybody following me? Yep. So with that said, I unfortunately had a family who um, actually quit during COVID, but then came back in March and went swim lessons. Very nice family, has two girls, and um, we had to let her know um, that unfortunately, we're, you know, we have to serve the other membership and yada, 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 and we can't do another set, but we'll circle back to you and let you know. But because she wasn't, ha she wasn't happy with my response, and we told her, um, I assured them we would circle back to them and let them know, but that we were open since October of last year. And though she could have came then, she decided to fall in my lap in March. And she wants to keep going all throughout the summer. So I posted to her, I said, well, you know, you know, how do you want us to serve? How would we be able to serve the other members? Well, she didn't care. She was like, I don't care about the other members. I want to be served. I said, I understand that. But we're trying to service everybody. So I went to my executive director with that intention of, and I spoke to the mom on the phone, spoke to the husband via text, explained the whole thing. She went and sent the executive director a big long email about everything we talked about, still not pleased. And I say to my executive director, you have to stand behind me because if we give in to her, then we have to tell the ones that we have currently right now that we have to do the same with them and that's not fair. Well, you want to- yeah. Right. So people are concerned about her and whether she's going to stick. But then the next question is, 
And what about the 20 other people who you might have gotten in and gotten into your process and everything else? Right. You know, I, I you're right. That's a, that, and it puts you in a hard position as a director who's been here for a long time. So I, and it's, it's not a, you know, it's not a money-making thing. It's not like she's got money, yada, 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 but I can't stress it enough that you can't do, you can't, you got to stand behind what our policy is right now. How can you give in to her? Well, you know what I mean? And, and then, and then us turn around other people and it puts us, it's just, and now I have to serve her and I'm bitter. No, so now I've got my, so now I'm going to put my WSIT hat on for a second. I'm going to try to solve this for you. I know I only got a couple of minutes left, Jordan, and we got like four slides left. So, um, but here, I'm going to give you the answer. The answer is what you're going to do is you're going to come up with a set of things that they can work on, that she can work on with her kids. You're going to sit her down. You're going to pull the stuff out. Of, um, there's a piece that you can do um, from, from basic water rescue or something like that, uh, where you can teach her holding positions and things like that. Um, and give her the checklist of stuff that she can come work on with her kids. Right, and I've told her that, thought of that. I'm not going to keep going because I don't want to waste anybody's time. But I don't know if anybody's been faced with this surge of lessons. But yeah, I try to tell her that work on the skills we taught with. Yada yada yada. Yeah, no. No, that that's the, but that's the that's right. the answer. I mean, I'll, I'll, I, I, you know, we're not going to dive into this forever and ever. But realistically speaking. Yeah. You know, I think most of us know this, that the kids who come and take lessons, the ones who actually progress are the ones who come back with their parents during free swim and actually practice. Right. And the ones who don't are the ones that, that yeah. just take forever to progress. Um, and that's just the way it is. So uh, I don't necessarily know that I mean this, but if you'd like somebody with national credentials to tell her that if she wants her kids to get better, she should take a month or two until you have a slot for her to come back and she should work with her kids. You know, you can feel free to tell them that the person from national said that she really needs to take weeks and work with her kids on her own one on one. And when they get to the next level, you'll be happy to see them again. Uh, but that actually ties into the last point that I had on the slide, which it offends people's sense of right and wrong when others are allowed to break the rules. So if you've been telling people we can only hit you for one session and you're going to need to wait a little bit. And that's what you've been telling people and people have been reasonable about that. Right. And then you all of a sudden break it and let this person do it. How are those folks who have been supportive of you, who are willing to stick with you and know that you're doing the best that you can, how are they going to feel along the way? So last note on this, right, especially when these rules are about health and safety, right? So um, here's a concept. We're going to hit this really quickly. Um, but for many of you, I've gone and visited a bunch of the JCC facilities and things like that. Um, and frequently I've had, before I've gotten there, I've gotten the bullet that says, this is the problem that we have. Um, and I really need to figure out how we're going to fix this problem. And I would say about 70% of the time, the problem that the executive director has given me to look at, my answer to the executive director has been fire the, fire the customer. Fire the customer. The, the behavior is extreme. It's abusive. It's, it's not okay and everything else. So here's the question. How do you know when it's the right time to fire a customer? Are the staff members prepared to quit rather than continue to deal with the customer? Think about how much time and effort it takes to properly train a staff member and get somebody who's good at doing this stuff. Somebody who's willing to sit in cold water while a kid spits in or sneezes in their face if you're doing swim lessons or all that other sort of stuff. Okay. All right, think of that versus, you know, the person who's regularly harassing them and making our life a living hell, right? Um, have staff members already left because they couldn't stand this person's behavior? Is behavior generally disruptive to normal operations? Are they standing outside the membership office yelling at the top of their lungs about how they're gonna leave and they're gonna tell all their friends and everything else? Okay. Um, does a customer consistently demand or expect treatment that exceeds what is generally offered, including access to complain to executives, senior staff, or others? And are other members, guests, or customers made uncomfortable or unhappy by that customer's behavior? Now, this is not a one-time thing. Everybody can have a bad day. But if we know that this is the way that people are reacting on a general basis, if they're consuming hours and hours of your executive time, maybe there is no right answer. Maybe it's time to follow the Disney way and actually say, Thanks for coming. Here's your money back, and show them the gate. So I, I know that we're we're at the at the 45 minute mark, but let's just uh, hit one quick concept. Um, sorry, Jordan, do I have a minute to hit one quick concept, and and a then minute. we'll get out of here? Okay. 
All right, so last thing I want you to think about, here's a quick turn, is, is this has kind of taken us to the question of how do we treat our essential employees? And I want you to think about two possible employees that you have at your JCC, all right? One is part-time paid near minimum wage, no paid holidays, no health insurance, no sick leave, has an inconsistent schedule. The other employee is full-time with a decent salary, possibly up to six figures, paid holidays, sick leave, 401k, flexible schedule and fringe benefits. And so I want you to think about what happens when there's a complaint. And for the purposes of this, let's think about the pool did not open on time at 5.30 in the morning, All right? How's the situation treated? Is the world gonna end? Is it gonna require the intervention of multiple departments? Is it gonna require several layers of management in order to get to a resolution of this issue? Does the level of negative response match the level of employee compensation and support? That's the question that I want to ask, right? If the thing is going to be oh, end of the world sort of thing, who's the person who's actually dealing with it? Come on, move on, All right? Um, if we're going to treat some of these issues like they're the end of the world, who are we expecting to deal with this thing that's going to be like the end of the world? And again, this is one of these thought-provoking, provocative sorts of things. Right? If it's the end of the world, why isn't the person who's making $90,000 dealing with it? In other words, why aren't they the person opening up at 5.30 in the morning? If it's absolutely critical that Mrs. Schwartz be able to get in and swim at 5.30 in the morning, why isn't the $90,000 person, $90,000 a year person doing it? And obviously our executives are not gonna be the people who are doing our day-to-day -day stuff. But part of what I'm trying to get you to think about is, yeah, but is it appropriate to treat the person who is responsible for these things, for the health and safety of the kids during camp, for being responsible for, you know, responding on a moment's notice to provide, uh, you know, life-saving support and things like that. Is it appropriate for us to keep treating them as if, you know, they're disposable? You know, how many of the people who have had to deal with problems with people opening in the morning, it also has had to, you know, people can't get there because, They've got a car that's a, that's a 20 year old junker because that's all they can afford, right? They can't live near the facility because they're not paid enough or they don't have a regular schedule. Um, they can't get a better place because they don't have a regular schedule that says that they have on incoming, they have income that's gonna support getting a place that's closer to where they are. Um, they can't come in because there's no access to, to childcare or support or things like that. But nevertheless, we're gonna put the weight of the world on those people's shoulders and then act as if they're horrible and irresponsible when we've never given them the resources in their real life to be able to, to respond to all of these things. Um, and that's actually what I'm doing these days. I, I actually have an organization called Advocates for Essential Employees. And during this entire COVID thing, I've been helping, to, helping people deal with the issues that um, have been key for essential employees, all right? Things like uh, they're the only person available to do stuff. They're put in a position where they're expected to be there and respond regardless of whether they or their child or their parent gets sick uh, and stuff like that. The people who have not had adequate personal protective gear uh, and things like that along the way, the you know organizations that don't provide sick leave. Um, I know Maryland recently passed a law that said that if you're a part-time employee, you're able to, to actually gain sick leave. And I know that that's become popular in a bunch of states, um, childcare support and things like that. So if we're gonna depend on these people and consider them essential to our operations, again, this is a good time to go back and talk to people because they're more conscious of the, well, we need to pay people more and we need to treat them better and we need to do some other sorts of things. Before you start, those, those issues aren't gonna go away. Just because people get their vaccinations and we stop being in, in COVID land all the time, those considerations aren't gonna go away. It's still gonna be true about the people who we consider our essential employees. All right, and here's how you can reach me um, if you need to get a hold of me and I can put that into chat as well. Sorry, Jordan, I'm sorry I ran late. There you go. That's okay, thank you, Bill. We have two more presenters, so I just wanna make sure that they have time to make their yep. presentations. Bill will stay on at the end um, to answer any additional questions that you might have. And thank you to Bill. Um, I'm not gonna go into their full bios because I wanna give them time to do their presentations, but Lauren Gale is the programming manager at the JCC of Greater Boston. Welcome, Laura. Lauren, sorry. <laughs> thank you. One second here. Um, Jordan, it's saying I can't share my screen. Oh, hold on one second.
you should be able to now. There we go. And you guys. All right. Can everybody see that? Awesome. Um, so like Jordan said, I am the programming manager here at the JCC of Greater Boston. I was able to listen to some of the um, presentations yesterday. So I tried to weave some things that people had questions about yesterday into sort of what we're doing today. Um, oops, there we go. Um, so our basic COVID changes where we um, implemented a reservation system as most people did. Um, all of our lap swimming is 45 minutes for each session. We use 15 minutes in between each session to clean the deck. Um, we found it most effective to use a bleach solution that we put in just your garden variety garden sprayer. Um, and we spray down the whole deck with a, with a bleach solution so that it doesn't take a ton of time and effort. Um, our locker rooms are open for changing, but we have essentially capped off all the showers. So nobody's tempted to use them um, after we have said no showering. Um, to allow more people to swim, we actually split the pool into widths. So instead of using our long 25 meter pool, we split, split our um, pool into 10 widths to allow more people to be safely in the pool at one time. Um, all of our swim lessons are one-on-one. -on -one. We are not offering any pods or private uh, group lessons rather at this time, but it's something that we're looking for in the future. Um, our swim team is currently at 110 kids instead of 150, but I will say on that, um, we've had a ton of interest in swim team. Um, a lot of the teams around here swim in colleges um, or other pools that are not allowing outside guests right now. So at the beginning of our season, we had a serious boom in who wanted to be on our swim team because so many swim teams in our area were closing. Um, we currently don't do any Friday programming. We're looking to bring some of that back, but it was just a way for us to condense everything to be able to um, control what we're doing for each one. Um, and then lastly, all of our payroll went completely digital, which has been huge for us. No more collecting pieces of paper in the back room or, you know, tracking somebody down for any of that. Um, so this diagram is a little bit funny um, when you look at it, but it sort of shows exactly how people move through our pool. So that green part um, is where they enter. They enter almost immediately into the middle of our pool. Um, and then they go up and around. Our whole pool is one way so that we can sort of control the flow. And then you'll see how that width setup sort of works. So we have a good portion of our pool that is open or, you know, the quarter of our pool that is open for lessons. And then there's the 10 lanes for people to do lap swimming in. It definitely was adjustment and adjustment for our lap swimmers um, to swim a short way rather than swimming the, the 25 meters. But overall, it's been, um, it's been really great for them to, you know, be able to have more people in the pool, but have it done safely. So just for our lap swim, I already went over this. We're using Mind Body for our reservations. It's 45 minutes. Um, we initially had everyone assigned their lane upon arrival. So in other words, they just went into whatever the first lane was. That caused a little bit of um, issues, but we've sort of worked those out now. Um, the rinse shower at the beginning, everybody's doing that. And then we put command hooks in place at the end of their width so that they can hang their stuff so they don't feel like it's like right on the pool or anything like that. Um, what we used to create the widths were boat anchors. They're actually drilled into the tile in our pool. That was a little bit time consuming, but our um, our facilities department was able to do it with um, general uh, without a lot of uh, interruptions. We made new lane lines too. Shout out to Harrison. He's on he's on the call as well. He was the one that uh, looped all of our lane lines together and made um, made it possible for so many people to um, be able to swim. Um, swim team, our kids come in and they follow that same one way. We made a red tape checkerboard. It looks exactly like a checkerboard would, would look. Um, and it allows the kids to put their items, their personal belongings in each space. So it allows them to um, keep their stuff spread out. We have actually asked them not to put their stuff in the locker rooms, even though the locker rooms are open, um, just because we can't monitor the locker rooms and see where they're putting stuff and, and, you know, and things like that. So we made a checkerboard for them on the deck to be able to put their bags um, separate from each other. 
Um, all of our swimmers are placed in the pool at cones. It's not really cones anymore because they've, you know, they've been in the water since June. So they have a good idea of where they're supposed to be. Um, our pool is very shallow. So our pool is uh, three and a half and then five feet in the middle and then three and a half feet on the other side. So it allows most of our kids to stand up um, and be able to have a spot where they can still stand, they can still hear the coaches, but they're spaced out from each other. Um, it's about 13 feet between any kid when they're, you know, when they're in their spot. Um, we decided to do less kids for the younger groups just because any of you that have ever dealt with a swim team or kids that are learning to swim know that it's really hard to get them to to lap swim with each other without crashing into each other or you know hitting each other or whatever it may be so our youngest kids um and our pre-swim group our pre-swim group used to be what we used to bridge our kids from our swim lessons to our swim team we merged those groups um, and those younger swimmers swim widths in the pool everybody else swims the length the 25 meters but the young kids swim with so that they each have their own lane. It's been really, really wonderful for us. Um, it's allowed the kids to feel a little bit more comfortable with swimming and in learning, learning swim team, but it's also made it so we are not petrified that they're going to slam into each other and, you know, um, crash into each other. So. Um, when our swim team gets out, they get out one at a time, they put their mask on, and then we move them to the door. So essentially they put their mask on, they grab their stuff, they wrap themselves up in their towel or whatever it may be, and then they head out the door. The next kid gets out, gets their mask on. Um, it's become a process and it's definitely taken a little bit of time away from our swim team, but it's the safest way that we've been able to do this and they're they're used to it now. Um, they, they know, we don't even actually have to tell them. We don't have to say, hey, Johnny, you're next. They just sort of look and they wait for the mask to be on and then they get out. So um, they're, really, they're really adjusting. Um, most of our kids come and go in their suits. Um, we are a USA team. I know there was questions about starting a USA team. So if anybody has questions about those meets or how to start a team or anything like that, please feel free to reach out to me. I won't go too much into it now. Um, and then all of our forms are online. So our IT department was able to put our registration form online, which was huge for us. It made it a whole lot easier for us to collect registrations, not be left with a bunch of papers, not have to do you know, the billing piece. Um, and then we worked to create a health attestation on Google Sheets so that the kids don't you know, we wanted to make sure that the parents were the ones saying that they were not, you know, that they were feeling fine and that they had no symptoms. We didn't want a seven year old coming in and saying, you know, when somebody says, do you have a headache or, you know, do you feel warm? Them saying like, yeah, I do. So we wanted to make sure that the parents were doing that piece. So the parents have to fill out this Google form every time that they come to practice. Um, our front desk checks them in, essentially says, what's your name? checks that their parents have done it and then lets them in the building. If they haven't done that, then I get a call and I get to call the parents and say, hey, can you can you please fill out that form? Um, we talked about the interest. Um, New England swimming has been really wonderful for us. Um, they made sure that any team that can't have meets at their pool has been able to to have a meet. They paired us with other teams that were able to follow COVID restrictions, but still offer meets. Um, so we have had meets. Um, it definitely looks a lot different than it looked before COVID, but my kids have been excited to, to race and that's been really wonderful for us. Um, the last thing that's changed about swim team is the time slots have changed. We used to start swim team around four o'clock um, you know, 4.30, somewhere in there. And now we start at 3.30. It's just to be able to get all of our, um, all of our groups in. Um, and the biggest change for that was my oldest group, my seniors changed from a two and a half hour practice to a two hour practice. They're pretty excited about it, but I'm not. Um, so hopefully sooner rather than later, we will be able to get them back to that two and a half hours um, so they can, you know, get their, get their training spots. Um, our master's team, they are in the water as well. Um, so we added spots to our master's team. We used to only run one session and now we run two. So it's six to seven and then seven to eight Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then seven to eight and eight to nine on Sunday. We added that second session just for our more compromised master's members so that they could swim one per lane. So essentially our earlier practice on both Tuesdays and Thursdays and Sundays runs 
just as a normal practice would. I'll show you the configuration in the next slide. Um, but our second practice, so that seven to eight and that eight to nine, runs with just one person per lane. Um, they have the same spread, you know, spread out as the, the swim team. And both of our swim team and our masters have built in no swim days which has been really helpful for sort of everything that's going on. We've done that for years because we're in New England and we might get slammed with snow and we might just, we, the center just might not be open. Um, but to have that flexibility in case we needed it has been always really comforting for, from, a, from a programming standpoint, but it's also understood by both participants that, you know, there may be days that we don't have swimming and you're not gonna get a, you know, any sort of refund anything for that. Um, we don't do drop-ins for, um, swim team or for masters. We do, for masters, we have a member and a non-member pricing. For swim team, you do have to be um, a member of our facility. Um, it does pose a problem for swim team if we need to do a tryout, but that's, you know, that's a case-to-case -case basis that we've been, um, we've been dealing with, so. This is our setup for the pool. You know, this is what it would look like when it's in that 25 meter configuration. The stars are people. So, you know, the edges of the picture are the walls. So essentially we have somebody at the wall. We have someone under the flags. We have someone right in the middle of the pool. And then again at the flags and then at the, um, at the wall. So each of those spots is somebody there and it wasn't a, it was a um an adjustment to get them to swim or learn where to start and finish um but you know they're used to it now and like i said we don't have to use the cones anymore we essentially had traffic cones in our pool bright green and bright um, orange traffic cones that told each swimmer where to start and stop um camp and our outdoor pool lauren sorry to interrupt just one more minute Okay, yep. Thank you. Um, camp and our members will be separate. Everybody talked about that. Camp will be from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Mondays and Fridays. We'll have both lessons and free swim. Um, our outdoor, outdoor pool will be pods for members. The camps are gonna be in strict pods. Swim lessons, we went from seven days to two days. You already saw this, um, this configuration. We just have separate spots for our lessons. Our instructors are wearing face shields. We're using iClass Pro for our swim lessons reservation. It's really great. It puts all of the cancellations or scheduling piece on the parents. So it's a little bit to set up, but it's been really great for us. Um, the other pieces I'm not worried about. And Adapted Aquatics, we are slowly bringing that back. We It's, it's a compromised group of people. So we wanted to make sure that we had um, a safe space for them. They're going to be swimming on Fridays when we don't have anything else in the pool. And then our add-ins are just family swim. Um, as numbers go down, we're gonna start adding more family swim. We're gonna go back to our long lanes um, configuration of the pool. And we are going to be looking at returning of sharing lanes and more shared spaces, vacation camps and outside rentals, so. Amazing, thank you so much, Lauren. We will make sure that Lauren's presentation is um, posted both in the SpotMe platform and sent out through the listserv so that you can all um, see all those amazing graphics that she created and all the points that she had to rush through. I apologize and um, please reach out to Lauren in the chat, although Harrison seems to be answering all of the questions, so that's terrific. Um, I wanna make sure that um, Jenny has time to do her presentation. So before she does that, please hang on for the whole presentation. I know she's worked really hard and she wants to make sure that everyone can hear about Swim Gym and what they're doing at the Miami Beach JCC. Um, so I'll quickly just do a few closing remarks so that um, Jenny can have plenty of time for her presentation. So just making sure at 2.30 Eastern today, we have the first opportunity for enrichment electives. So please go back to SpotMe and check those out. Um, also, our colleagues are our best teachers as we're learning today. So from 4 to 5 p.m. today, Eastern is the JCC Excellence Showcase. There's 30 minute sessions um, where you can learn initiatives that JCCs are doing that can be replicated in your JCC. And a final reminder about the virtual vendor hall tomorrow from 1.45 to 2.45 p.m. All right, um, with that, I will throw it over to Jenny Strauss and she's the Swim Gym Program Director at the Miami Beach JCC. Jenny, you're on. Okay, hi, how are you? Um, well, I guess I got my introduction, so I'm not going to introduce myself again. Um, all I wanted to tell you that uh, to be able to run a complete program, you need to have a team. And for me, my staff is amazing. And I have next to me, Jacqueline, that it's been always um, helping me and she's been with us for uh, since she was a little girl. And also I have my husband, Robert, 
who jo who's jointly with me owning the program, as well as my son, Jonathan Strauss. Um, I'm going to, I think, share the screen and we go ahead and start with the presentation. Um, I'm just going to talk to you about what COVID has uh, impacted us. Because if I go into what the programming is all about and how we do their swimming lessons, it becomes um, too much. So um, if you have any questions in regard to, um, to how we run our program, you can just email me and I'll be glad to, uh, to do it uh, with you guys and give you all the imp in information. So my presentation is really mainly of how we changed from, um, from pre-COVID, from, from the pre-COVID times to what's happening right now. Um, our swimming pool or our center completely closed March 16th, and then we reopened uh, June 8th. But during those months, we had to reinvent ourselves and start a whole new way of how are we going to be able to run this program at the Miami Beach JCC. I just want you to know that our pool is only a three lane pool and we have a beach entry, which has some areas I'm gonna show you in my diagrams. So we've had to do a lot of um, organization in order to be able to accommodate the amount of people that we need to accommodate. And we really try to teach as many people as we can. And we have done tremendously and we don't turn people around. If we cannot start them right away, we explain we will start you in a couple of weeks. So we went from group sessions because our main concern in our swimming is to uh, save lives. So we teach swimming and the Learn to Swim is our biggest uh, uh, program. Our, our uh, summer camp is also very big, but also we have a component of um, swim team because we are a USS team. But our team was always a very small component. We only had maybe 10, 12 kids. We were only promoting from within. So we never uh, were interested in making it very big. But during COVID, it really has changed. Um, let's see if I can go, okay. So in this slide, you can see what we did with all our protocols. I'm not gonna go into the protocols because I would imagine that everybody has the same type of protocols and we just went into it. We're very lucky because we are in an outdoor um, pool. So for us, it's very simple. We don't have the issues that you guys have of how to enter the pool, how to get out of the pool because we're outdoors. So we really haven't had any problems in that regard. So we went into a, a very interesting programming and we call it the quarantine. So we developed a program where we do mostly private lessons and only um, groups, but the groups are three to four kids only, but they need to be from a family or kids that have been together during COVID, okay? So here is our pool. So you can see that our pool is very small. We only really have three lanes and then you see all those other areas and we have an amazing rock wall that you can see it there. And then we have those cones. You can see that that is our swim team. So why I wanna tell you is that our swim team from 10 children went into 60 kids because what we did during the months that we were closed, we, we do evaluations every, um, quarter that we have classes. We do go like through a 10 session program all the time and we evaluate. And at that time when we were closing, it was the end of our winter season. So we knew exactly which kids were ready to go into the next level. And the kids that were the oldest ones, like I've heard many people say, you know, with the younger ones, you have issues of putting them into groups because they're really not gonna follow instructions. But these older kids, seven and up or six and up, are really more uh, into it. And if they're ready, we just want to develop them into what they want to go. So um, we send out information to all these people telling them as soon as we open, you're welcome to come in and have some swimming lessons and get ready for team starting in August. And that is exactly what happened. So in the summer we had, we organized a program for the swim team 
where we introduced, um, you see those cones, sorry, the cones there, all those cones is where we do our dryland practice. So we, we, um, we made the dryland practice as part of the swimming practice. So the children have a combination and we use the whole area of the pool. So at that time, we had maybe 14 or 15 kids that joined and we used the whole pool and it was an hour practice and we didn't allow anybody else. It was at 7 a.m. in the morning. That was our test to see when we would come back, how we would do it. So that's what happened there. Our another, next, I guess. Okay, so this is the way the practice goes. You know, we have in every cone, there is an exercise that they need to do and then the children are circulating around those cones and going around the pool. We've seen a, prog a, pro I mean, a progression of this, it's amazing. And this is why people are wanting to come to our program all the time. Um, we're really swamped like everybody else. We are teaching tons of children to swim. And I think it's because of the setup of the private lesson and the semi-private and the small group that these children are really being, I have an amazing group of teachers and they're doing great. So this is pretty much the setup of that. Then this is our, our star, which is our summer camp. So then we, we developed this a long time ago, I would say 20 years ago, we decided, you know, we've only done swimming through water play. And that's really our, our idea of swim gym is that the children come to play, but there's a directed play. So we, we've we done and we've been very successful in what we do for our summer camp because the children don't just come to have a swimming class. They're coming to have a play time that is directed. And it's all, the idea is that everything that we do in the play, it goes into what it's going to develop into strokes. So you see different areas of the pool and that's how we divide the pool all the time. So they will go from different areas, from one area to the next, and that's how they are going to be circulating through the pool. And it really makes a lot of fun. And even the older children, the 11 and 12s that are always so difficult to come bring to the pool, they love it. They think, oh my God, today we're gonna play water polo. It's great. So they, they do that. Um, it goes. We also have an amazing little gadget that it's a, it's a winch. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. So we used to run a program that it's called, it was called the Swim Gym Aquatic Sports Camp. So we brought it to the pool. We used to have an ocean, we used to have boats, but we don't have boats anymore. So we have the winch and the winch is like, a, a, it's a machine that pulls the children in the wakeboard. So we don't have really wakeboards in the pool, but we have some type of a wakeboard and the kids love it. We do this once, a week during camp. And Penny, know, there's a question. How yeah. deep is the area around the rock wall? It's only it's five feet, maybe. It's very, we, our pool is very shallow. It's three feet on each end. And then the deepest part is five feet. That's okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. And um, I mean, and we do a lot of the, you know, if we go into the COVID situation, we're very strict around the pool. We can only have, now 30 people around the pool, counting swimmers and parents, because for swimming, we do allow the parents to come in because we need them to bring them, especially the younger ones and take them out. For our lab swimmers and our members, they have reservations like everybody else. And in the beginning, we only had 30 minute reservations. Now we go into 45 minute reservations. But again, we only have three lanes and the areas that you see there, are, are where we go. So I guess that's my, my uh, presentation there. But I can go back if you want to see the, how the pool is set up. And where you see the lane lines dividing, it's how we divide the pool. So we have the rock wall area, the shallow area, and the lanes, the lap lanes. 
Well, I, for one, is, am super impressed by all of the imagery that both you and Lauren <laughs> came up with. I'm, I'm impressed. You should go into graphic design in your future careers. Um, but I want to thank Jenny and Lauren and Bill and Corinne for an excellent session. Um, I've put Lauren and Jenny's email addresses in the chat, so you can feel free to reach out to them about the programming that they're doing. They can answer any questions. Jenny can answer some questions about Swim Gym pre-COVID, and maybe that's something that anyone wants to get into. So thank you all for continuing to stay on and we will have more sessions like this coming up in the future where we will encourage you in the field to share what's going on in your JCCs. So thank you to everyone um, and we look forward to seeing you soon.